was uh, very pleased with our 7th and 8th graders uh, this past uh, Wednesday. Uh, we had a lively discussion on uh, many different topics, and uh, one of the topics we were discussing for a few moments was Life Sunday, this Sunday, with the historic, ancient, holy Christian church. Uh, speaks on behalf of those who cannot speak for themselves, saying that all life is precious. From the first day a person is in the womb of one's mother to the last day that we leave here on earth, Jesus Christ sanctifies life from beginning to end. And we take the position, because it grows out of God's holy word, that it is up to those, especially who love Christ, to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. You see the beautiful banner there, the wonder of it all, with that little baby there. The little baby cannot speak up for itself, so we speak up in behalf of the little children. And uh, that beautiful picture of the baby there uh, reminds us that the dignity of little babies has been elevated because God himself became a baby in fulfillment of the powerful promise in Isaiah that Jesus would be born of the Virgin Mary. God becomes a baby and sanctifies life and elevates children and all others to a place of dignity. The Bible says, Proverbs 31, 8 and 9, Speak out for those who cannot speak, for the rights of those who are doomed. So, love. Jesus' love seeks to be a brother's keeper, not the grim reaper. Christ's love seeks to be a good Samaritan, and as far as possible, we try to help people who are down and out and very vulnerable. That's what Christ's love, God's love, does. The young adults uh, had a good conversation uh, with this, and I asked them uh, a particular question. Why is it that Jesus is pro-life, and why is it wrong to kill and take the life of a child in the womb? And I said, I want you to think about that question in light of the golden rule. So they thought about the golden rule. The golden rule is this, as you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And one of the students that I was talking was you that said, if you are in the womb of a mother, you do not want someone to take your life, to kill you, to dismember you. So the whole movement of abortion uh, there violates the golden rule. Uh, that wonderful rule that Jesus set forth in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, 12, on which all the prophets and Moses hang upon. It is part of the essence of love. Whenever a culture goes the pro-abortion way, it's not a one-issue issue. There is slippage in all kinds of areas. It isn't an accident for the fact that we've gone to support abortion in over 50 million children since 1973 have been in America alone murdered through abortion. But we see more sex trafficking. We see more people trying to enslave other people with drugs. We see a breakdown in general of law and love in our society. Because the law is an organic thing. You can't say I'm going to break one portion of God's law and say I'm going to keep 99% of the rest. It all hangs together. So we've seen tremendous slippage in our society as a result of what happened in 1973 when the Supreme Court set forth an immoral law, namely that individuals could take the lives of children within the womb. It may be legal, but it isn't moral. Because, and here's the bottom line, the one who came into this world to be the savior of mankind, the one who created this world, Lord of the universe, Jesus Christ says, let the little children come unto me. That's the bottom line for Christians. Let the little children come unto me and forgive them not. The Lord of life says also, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. The beautiful thing about the Bible is that it is so coherent. Uh, it is the only book, as we've always said, that avoids the extremes of legalism or lawlessness. 
but the Bible is very coherent on life matters. Psalm 139 declared, Lord, you created my inner being and wove me together in my mother's womb. Shortly after our Lord saved the children of Israel from slavery and the bondage of Pharaoh, he set forth not only the ten words, including you shall not murder, but he gives an exposition of love, all the various different aspects of love. He wanted his people to reflect love, that they might draw others to God's word, and he could set forth the forgiving word of love to all nations. But here's a couple things from God's word. After Moses gives to them the ten words from Sinai, these are aspects of love. Don't take a bribe. How many people take bribes today? Don't kill an innocent person. Don't take advantage of the little guy, the alien, the foreigner. All these are from Exodus chapter 23. If men who are fighting hit a pregnant woman so that she delivers her child prematurely and there is no harm to either mother or child, the man should pay the fine her husband puts on him with the help of judges. So life was very precious in the womb of the mother, and this is coherently taught in both the Old and the New Testament, and of course we would expect the Holy Spirit to teach coherently. Um, one of my favorite books in the Bible is uh, Luke, and Luke is the gospel for the underdog. Uh, it emphasizes that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, but it really has a special emphasis how Jesus seeks to help the underdog. When Christ is born on Christmas Day, who is it that is there as the welcome wagon? It's the outcast shepherds, the little guys. Zacchaeus, the little guy, is up in a tree. He's an outcast, and Jesus said, Today I've come to bring salvation to your home. And then there's the story on Good Friday where the repentant thief on the cross, a corrupt son of Abraham, is dying. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. The whole Bible seeks to reach out to all mankind with a special emphasis that the God of all grace is for the underdog. The very fact that God chose Israel, a nation of underdogs, a nation of slaves, shouts at the news that there are no ordinary people, but that every person is precious in the sight of God. God said to Israel, it wasn't because you were the greatest of all nations, you were the least of all people, it was because you were the least of all people that I sent my infinite affection and love upon you. The whole abortion industry is a brutal, billion dollar industry laced with racism, destroying the wombs of women and the lives of infants and the soul of a nation. And it basically is a philosophy of me, me, me. I, I, I. It doesn't take into consideration both the mother and the child. The Bible always goes so much deeper than the philosophies of the world. Uh, the world hammers into our head this question, what's in it for me, for me, for me? It, it doesn't capture the weakness of what love is to look like. Just for a moment, Genesis chapter 25, if you get a chance, uh, mull that over. This is an interesting chapter, and it has so much in it. But Rebecca, after 20 years of waiting, prays to the Lord, and Isaac prays to the Lord, and the Lord gives her not only a baby, but two babies in her womb. And so she has two twins, two baby boys, and the two baby boys are banging into each other, they're knocking each other around, there's an all-star wrestling match going on in her womb, and poor Rebecca, during her pregnancy, is miserable. And she's wondering, Lord, what is this mean? What's going on here? The pregnancy shouldn't be this difficult, she was saying. And so she prays to the Lord, and the Lord comes to her and says, Rebecca, I got good news for you and challenging news for you, but you have two in your womb. And there are two boys. And these two boys are going to be the foundation of a nation of peace. And so both of them are, are 
are going to be, you got two little lesions in your womb. And so that kind of gave her comfort there to hang in there. And when the firstborn son was born, he was a hairy baby, they said. And so his name was called Esau, which means hairy. So he comes out of the womb. Harry comes out of the womb, and there's little Esau grabbing his foot, hanging on for dear life because they were still fighting, even as they came out of the womb, and he was called the heel, H-E-E-L, holder. And so Rebecca was relieved, and then they had the challenge to raise these two boys who continued to be somewhat all-star wrestlers there. The point there is, the Bible makes clear that these little baby boys in the womb were children, that they were life. Not only just children, they were nations. They were the foundation of nations there. Humans, because of selfishness, we are prone, and this happens all the time, we want to define the little baby out of existence. And this gets into the Hitler thing. This is why it's such a big issue. I'm just going to step over Dennis to the uh, banner here so you can track me a little bit. But this is the Hitler kind of thing. What Hitler did to the Jewish people, he said, we're just going to say we're not people so we can define them out of existence and it will be okay to, quote, kill them. It's not okay from God's point of view. So people want to define the baby out of existence. People want to define marriage out of existence, given an entirely different meaning. People want to define sin out of existence. People want to define love out of existence. But the coherent view of Bible says, the beautiful image of this beautiful baby and this beautiful banner, the one who gives that child dignity is Jesus Christ, God in flesh, who became a baby himself. That's the whole core there. It is part of God's radical, radical grace. Now we're driving home to kind of the concluding point here. A lot of people ask, Pastor, when does life begin? And the Bible goes kind of deep here, but simple and clear at the same time. Here's what the Bible says. Paul writes, and Paul understood the Old Testament uh, better than anybody in his day, I suspect. He memorized the whole thing as he studied for uh, it in his uh, study with Emmanuel. But here's what Paul says. In love, Jesus' love, in Christ, God chose you and me and called us by name before the universe was created. That's radical grace alone. In love, God loved you before the universe was created. God loved you before time and space. He knew you. He not only knew that you would be sitting here today, what you would wear, how you would feel, but He loved you before the universe was created. That's when life begins. And God loved us before we were us. God loved us before the world was created, before the universe was formed, before Andromeda and the Milky Way came into existence. God loved you. And He planned our salvation. God knew your name. The beautiful song that Twyla sang by Jim Likens, we heard earlier. That's a wonderful primal hope. Jim Croce sang it, I got a name. Now we want uh, us to be more than just a name, but someone that's loved with a name. When you were baptized, think of this. Your name was baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, into the body of Christ, into the death of Christ, into the resurrection of Christ, into the love of Christ, into the eternal love of Christ. You were baptized. Before the light of day shined in your face, God knew your name. He knew us before time and space, and He loved us before all time. God so loved the world. And in love and in Christ, He chose you and me and brings forgiveness to you and me and loves you and me and has made our bodies His temple. All of this and much more we celebrate on Life Sunday. The peace of God, which passes, surpasses all understanding. May it guard and keep your hearts and minds in Him who loved you before the creation of the universe, Jesus Christ. Amen.